And by the way, we don't usually start here. We kind of take this for granted, which is another hobby horse of mine. We're living, we're living in an environment in evangelicalism where, where it, it is not so much that we overtly deny basic core spiritual truths. It's not that we do that. It's that we, we treat it as the background or the wallpaper or we take it for granted or we make assumptions about it. And I think, guys, we need to not make assumptions about essence. We ought to lead with the essence. And so the very first thing is brokenness. God can't trust me with his assignments if I'm going to make it another line on my biographical sketch or resume. The second thing that every great man or woman of God that had in common that God trusted with his assignments. First, they were marked by brokenness. And number two, they were marked by, and I got to explain this one, something that I call uncommon communion. Well, what do you mean by that? What, what I mean by that is not our devotional lives. But what I, what I mean by that, and I wish I had a explain this better in the book. You know, when you write something, it goes out there, you go, oh man, I should have said this. I wish I'd explained this better in the book. What I mean by uncommon communion, now follow me on this one, follow me on this one. When God calls a man to do something, he gives us an assignment, that he presupposes gap. What do you mean by gap? God's assignments are never, we, we never have the adequate resources or competencies to do what God's called us to do. The very nature of his assignments are beyond our ability because it's a statement about God and what God wants to do during your moment in history. So it presupposes gap. Now follow me closely here. And the reason why it presupposes gap is because for a leader, for a leader, God wants the leader to be the portrait of the desired destination at which others should arrive. And that's the reason why in the Bible, it's always leadership is always couched in terms of character. There is a prophetic nature about leadership in God's assignments. That's the reason why we hear leadership is lonely. Well, that's, there's a reason for that. Because I have got to be the portrait over here of the place at which the people that I'm leading should arrive. That's the reason why when you read the callings of leaders, the impossibility of the assignment, presuppose in that calling, God tells them and gives them this, 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 this whole uh, um, uh, uh, pathway to intimacy with him. Uh, Phillips Brooks says it better than me. He says, don't ask for tasks equal to your powers but rather ask for powers equal to your task so that the doing of the work is not the miracle, but you become the miracle in the process of doing the work. And I'm going to explain this a little, get, get a little, little more here, but, but, but my, 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 point, my point is this. Look, once I began to understand this, this really has helped me with this whole issue of burnout in ministry. We need to think differently about the assignments that God gives us don't view them as competing with the rest of my walk with God, but view it as God's primary means of sanctifying me. And that the gap is a call to intimacy. The gap is a call to the very presence of God. Exodus 33, let's pick on Moses again. We could go any place. Moses had this tent of meeting. And by the way, the reason why God does not explain all the eventualities and this kind of thing with the assignments that he gives us is for this very reason. Because it is to demonstrate the power and the glory of God and never a statement about my own abilities. So Moses has this tent of meeting. And I could get sidetracked. There's seven wonderful lessons from the tent of meeting. We could go into this. But Moses takes this tent. Now, mind you, conservatively, at this juncture, there's over two million Israelites Every morning, he takes this tent, this tent and goes outside the camp, away from distractions, away from the issues. And all of Israel would watch their leader with this tent go outside the camp. The text says that they would, they would get a little anxious and excited about this. He would pitch this tent outside the camp, and he would go in there and talk to God. Although the text didn't say what he asked him, I guarantee you we know what he asked him. God, help me. 
Help me. What do you want me to do? Help me. The Bible says that God would speak to him face to face. And Joshua will be standing outside that tent. It was the becoming of Moses that made him an effective leader. Don't miss that. Please don't miss that. Please don't miss that. It was the becoming of Moses that made him an effective leader. It wasn't the accomplishments of Moses. The accomplishments were God's accomplishments, but it was the becoming of Moses that made him a great leader. So, God gives us an assignment, and what I mean by uncommon communion is that that assignment drives us to touch the heart of God, to tap into the resources, to translate the vision to reality. Truly great godly leaders have great prayer lives. Their leadership is marked by calluses on their knees and not the various leadership paradigms on their bookshelves. It's marked by the touch in the hand of God. And God develops you in that whole process. A friend of mine, uh, Tim Cash, just became a senior pastor, a wonderful, wonderful friend. He used to be the... uh, chaplain of uh, the Atlanta Braves, uh, Tim pitched for Houston and L.A. for a number of years. We share a love for baseball, and Tim was telling me a few years ago, he was telling me his story. He said, Crawford, I have a buddy of mine that just bounced around in the minor leagues, and uh, great ball player, but it's just, you know, I don't know if you follow baseball or anything. It's sometimes, you know, baseball more than any other professional sport, it's just the luck of the draw. I mean, you can get in a minor league system where they've got People that play your position, they're deep there, and you can, you know. So he bounced around until he was like 30 years old, went on and played in Japan a little bit, came back. And, and, you know, at 30 years old, in professional baseball, if you ain't made it to the show by then, it's like, you know, you probably need to do something else. So finally he got called up. Well, he got called up to the big leagues, and wouldn't you know it, after about two weeks, two, three weeks, he had an injury that ended his career. And Tim said, this is a good friend of mine. He said, Crawford, I called him, and, and he said, listen to what he said to me. I said, man, I, am, I know that you had this dream, you endured, and you put up with stuff, and you get here. I said, this is really bad. It's terrible. And listen to what he said. He said, Crawford, he said to me, Timmy, look, man, I, I know you feel bad, but I honestly don't feel as bad as you do. <laughs> because several years ago, while I was bouncing around in the minor leagues, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And on my way to accomplishing something, I became something. And there, there, there should never be this separation in your walk and relationship with God between what you do and who you are. Now, what I just said really slaps against some of the stuff that we preach in sanctification. We said doing, you've got to be before you do. I hope I don't get in trouble, but that... I understand what we mean by that, but too much of a separation of that is unbiblical. The truth of the matter is God uses what we do to help us to be. And is in the process of living out what he's called us to do, pushing into his heart that we become And that's what the passion is. I want to get back to something before I transition into the the fourth one. You know, guys, uh, um, if, if you're not willing to be a model of what people should become, uh, I, I know of no other kind of way of saying, or direct way of saying this is just get out of leadership. Don't go there. Don't go there. Because that is the vision. Everything that God does in the world is incarnational. And modeling is everything. 
Now, every great man or woman of God that God trusted with his assignments, they were characterized by brokenness. Number two, they were characterized by uncommon communion. But let me give you the, the third one here, and I want to say this strongly. They were characterized by servanthood as an identity, not as a strategy. As an identity, not as a strategy. You say, well, Crawford, what, 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 are, you, what, are, you, what are you doing? A lot of this servant leadership talk that's been going on for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, if you hear anybody speak on leadership these days, somewhere in the conversation, they've got to drop in servant leadership. Well, a lot of the servant leadership language, not only from a secular perspective, but also in Christian circles, uh, to be honest with you, it leaves me a little flat. And the reason for that is that I can't help it. Maybe I'm a little cynical at this stage, but I hear a little bit of quid pro quo back here. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, you know, um, we'll use servant leadership as a strategy to affect something. You know, I mean... Uh, I do something for you, okay, you owe me one, I'm building up my chips, and so I'm going to call them in one day, because I need a favor from you. And so we get very utilitarian about ministry. Well, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, in the Bible, great leaders never led because of reciprocity. They didn't do it because of reciprocity. They didn't, they, they didn't lead because the sheep was going to do something for them. You see, if you give looking for something in return, you've not given, but you've invested. And as a leader, God has called us not to invest, but to give. It is the giving of ourselves, the giving of our lives, the giving of who we are. And I could go almost anywhere with that. I mean, you could use the illustration of David when his son was chasing him, and you remember Shimei going around the ridge there and cursing him and throwing stuff at him, and, you know, and they want him to say, they say, David, you want me to go cut off his head? And then David said, no, what have I got to do with you, O sons of Zerah? Don't do that. Maybe God called him to curse. My point being there, maybe David got it. David was saying, you know, maybe I got too fat and sassy and forgot that I was to be a servant leader. Maybe I do need to be humiliated. And some would say, well, Crawford, maybe you're over... Uh, stating that maybe he was distraught his son is out to kill him you know hit the fell is kind of like stabbed him in the back and all of this stuff and maybe David was a little over the top and not seeing things clearly well you know when he comes back and his son is killed and Shimei sees him now Shimei needs adult diapers okay because he's go oops and, and they say the same thing David should we off him and David says I love this line. I love it, I love it, I love it. This is, this is security. <laughs> David messed up, okay, but this, this character thing was big to him. David says, look, he says the same thing. Look, I haven't changed the song. But wait, 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 kill him? What am I going to do with you, sons of Zerah? Then it's this line. This line. Don't you know that I know that I'm the king. Great leaders very seldom use power. I didn't say that they didn't use it all. There is the appropriate use of power. There is the appropriate. But great leaders very seldom, very seldom use power. By the way, when Bill Bright was alive, and still to this day, I serve on the board of Campus Crusade. Interestingly enough, one of the fastest ways for a leader to get kicked off staff, one of the fastest ways, and I don't know what it was about Dr. Bright, but if you were in any degree of leadership, if he heard that you were playing power games with people and autocratically using them, you're gone. Immorality, funny with the money, and abusing people was a ticket off staff. Power is like money. The less you use, the more you have. And David modeled that, that he was a servant of Israel. The ultimate example of, of that servant leadership, obviously, is John 13, the washing of the disciples' feet. We've heard that story so often. 
But I want to remind us of the context there. You, you, know, you know why Peter was so upset, don't you? If you knew the customs of the times, a uh, couple of things. You know, if you were a household of some substance and you had servants, the nastiest job was washing the feet of the guests. That was the, that was the nastiest, the lowliest of all the servants did that. I mean, the lowliest of all. That. You know, they washed feet for a couple of reasons, you know, uh, traveling and feet swelling and it's a hospitality thing. The other thing is that, you know, you know how they ate. They didn't have chairs. They ate reclined. And you want somebody sticking their dirty, stinking feet in your lamb stew, so you, you just wash the feet. So there was nobody there to do that, and Jesus could have pulled rank. He could have said, Peter, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, one of you guys, go get the water, wash his feet, you know, and I got some important things to say. I'm getting ready to summarize everything that I've taught you in three and a half years in this upper room discourse, and so I need to think this thing through. And that would have been legit, right? The one who created them, who would die for them, who is pleading at the right hand of the God, God the Father, wraps a towel, gets a basin, and he washes their feet. He says, Peter, I want you to shut up because I want to teach you a lesson in leadership that you should never, ever, ever, ever forget. One of the personal things I try to do, you know, people treat me fairly nice now. I get a few scud missiles every once in a while, but they, they treat me fairly nice and better than I deserve. And I try not to ever forget this. Crawford, don't you ever, ever ask anybody, whether it's our custodial staff around our church no matter who it is, don't you ever ask anybody to do anything that either you have not done yourself or you're not willing to do. Don't you ever do that. See, in the Bible, the only reason why a leader has a position is because it's a platform to serve. And the best way of finding leaders is to find the servants. That's why about, you know, I, in Leadership and Crusade, I, I developed this personal policy. There's a few rare exceptions to this, but 95% of the time, even to this day, 95% of the time, anybody that comes to me that's campaigning for a position, I won't give it to them. I typically, because in the back of my head, I'm going, why do you want this so bad? Are you going to use it to serve people? Or do you need a, a platform? Or is this some sort of like dues paying thing in your head? Or is this a recognition piece? Or is this really all about you? Uh, why do you want this? And younger leaders here, ask yourself the motive question. Why do I want this? Greatness finds people. And the people who look for greatness, it always eludes them. It is a product of being a servant. Every great man or woman of God that God has trusted with his assignments has been characterized by brokenness, uncommon communion, servanthood as an identity not as a strategy. But the fourth and the final one is radical, immediate obedience. Now, you know, I know, I know that I'm being unnecessarily redundant here because in the Bible, you either obey or you don't obey. And in the Bible, obedience presupposes being radical. But I wanted to say it that way. I want to say it that way because we need to objectify God's assignments and allow me to share my heart here that some concerns that I have. 
I've been around parachurch ministries uh, a good portion of my life, and I've been involved with them, and I sit on several boards, and I, I pastor a church that is, uh, you know, thriving and, and this kind of thing. And I, I, I got to tell you, one of the things that disturbs me to no end right now, and it scares me to death, I'm scared of this career approach to Christianity that has been institutionalized. It frightens me. It frightens me. We, 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 we have this penchant to despiritualize everything that we do. And we have this incestuous relationship with the world. And, we, and we're extracting and raping ourselves of God's uniqueness by dumbing down the callings of God. And God's assignments are supernatural. There's, super, there's something that God wants done in human history. It's not like getting a job at IBM or Kmart. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me, I, do, I believe, I believe uh, all of those are callings. You've got to be equally called to work at General Motors or, or, or you know, uh, a finance company as well as to church. I get that. But there has to be spirit-directed intentionality in hearing from God. So you'll do all of God's will. I, I, I really love the eulogy of David, uh, David's eulogy of, uh, I'm sorry, Paul's eulogy of Saul over in Acts chapter 13. Saul, i am got my tongue in the wrong places. Paul's eulogy of David when he contrasts, him, contrasts his leadership with that of Saul is what I meant to say. Acts chapter 13. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 22. Paul says, and when he, meaning God, had removed him, meaning Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I love this. I love this. I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The word will there in the Greek text is plural. Wills. Uh, as in assignments. It's interesting, God said, you know, unlike Saul, who is hedging himself and scared, and giving this incremental obedience, partial obedience, I found in David, he, he, he's going to do everything I tell him to do. And then the line down in verse 36, the famous line, for David, after he had served the purpose, all the wills of God, weaving the tapestry of God's overall purpose for his life, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. There are times in my life when just the, I'm like everybody else, the avalanche of stuff, deadlines, things that need to be done, issues. God brings me to places of brokenness. Happened just the other week. And certainly there are times in which you overcommit. I'm guilty. You know, some, sometimes my heart writes a check that my calendar or my head can't cash. But then there are times in which the Lord has you over your head. And this text will come to mind. And I remember what one of my mentors told me when I was in my 20s. Crawford, you don't ever have to be successful. But you got to be obedient. Amen. Guys, you don't have to be successful. But you got to be obedient. And the vision that should grab your heart as a young leader or as a leader is that I want to be able to stand before God and say to him, you know, Lord, you know, it wasn't the sharpest pencil in the, in the box. 
but I did everything that you told me to do. I didn't run. I stood there. I did it. Before we get into some Q&A, let me give you a couple of things that, um, you know, when I started teaching this stuff, and this is, um, and please forgive me, this is just all high fly by, and I've, I've done a very silly thing, giving the content of a whole book in summary form, and not, I'm sure I miss a bunch of stuff that I probably should have said. But let me give you some personal things that how Crawford operates, and I want to pass this on to you. It's not because it's me, but taking a look at these four things, what kind of demeanor should I have? Some years ago, I asked myself that question. What, what kind of demeanor should I have? Well, here are three or four things. Number one is this. Crawford, don't ever tell God how to use you. Don't tell God how to use you. Experience is a blessing, but also experience can be a curse. Because with experience comes the dastardly tendency to typecast yourself in God. You can get terribly prescriptive because of patterns in your life. And that's when it becomes dangerous. You know, you know one of the things I've seen with older Christians? Interestingly enough, there's more of a struggle with faith when you, the longer you walk with the Lord than it was before you had stuff. Because there are all these these nice sounding stewardship language nonsense that we use that really is an excuse for fear. But always keep your hands open and your heart open. Don't be prescriptive with God. Don't assume and don't ever tell God how to use you.